Deheb for the introduction and giving me and for giving me the opportunity to present my work in the seminar. So this work, as you said, on important sampling for the mckeen flesov stochastic differential equation. This is a collaboration between my PhD supervisor, Professor Raul Tempona, as well as uh, Nadir Bendrache, who is at the uh, University of Leeds now, and also Abdul Latif Haji Ali at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. All right, so we can start. Um, so in the first part, I want to introduce the uh, stochastic differential equation that we are interested in and the associated notation along with the problem in hand that we solve. Uh, then I will introduce the double loop Monte Carlo estimator we developed uh, to estimate rare event probabilities um, associated with uh, the mckeen flesov SDE. Then we extend this estimator to the multi-level setting. And at the end, we apply our estimators to a simple one-dimensional example of the mckeen flesov SDE, right? So before I start with the notation, I want to quickly introduce you to the motivation behind uh, or the or where the uh, mckeen flesov SDE originates from. So actually such an equation originates from the study of uh, stochastic interacting particle systems which actually have a wide range of applications um, for example in studying pedestrian dynamics or collective animal behavior and interaction between biological cells it is also used in certain mathematical finance models and in the mean field limit of such stochastic interacting particle systems they tend to follow uh, the mckeen flesov stochastic differential equation in which we are interested in. To explain this further, I would first start with introducing what a stochastic interacting particle system is. So the stochastic interacting particle system is a set of P coupled D dimensional stochastic differential equations, which solve for the particles X, P, right? So here you in this equation, you also have the drift and diffusion coefficients, which are not only dependent on the state of the particle itself, but also on some average over some kernel of the particle along with the uh, other particles in the system, right? So, um, and another thing is that it is driven, each particle is driven by its uh, Wiener process, uh, Wiener process WP, and the Wiener paths of each of these particles are mutually independent of each other. One note is that the joint PDF of these particles can actually is actually given by the corresponding Fokker-Planck PDE, but uh, it is it will be a P cross D dimensional due to the nature of the system, right? And what happens in the mean field limit is that suppose when the particles, when the number of particles in the system tends to infinity, then each particle in the system stops seeing the other particles individually and only sees um, kind of the distribution of the particles, right? So that is how we get the mckeen flesov stochastic differential equation here. So let us consider the process X which follows the following ETO SDE, and it is D dimensional process, right? So it is a special class of uh, SDEs whose drift and diffusion coefficients depend on the dis probability distribution of the solution itself, which is denoted by mu t here, in here, right? Um, another note is that the initial conditions are also random here. Um, there have already been some nice works which prove the existence and uniqueness of solutions to such an equation. And um, here, um, going into a bit more detail, you have uh, WT, which is the Wiener process, which drives the dynamics of the uh, process of X. And it is D-dimensional with independent components. And as I said, mu is the distribution function of uh, the process X, right? Um, now, if you look at the uh, distribution, the equation governing the distribution of the process X, which is given by the Fokker-Planck PDE, it is nonlinear, 
because the drift and diffusion coefficients also depend on the uh, distribution itself and it is integral differential because of the um, because of these integrals over here right and one another thing you can notice is that if we approximate this distribution by some empirical distribution with some num capital p particles as defined here you can actually then plug this into uh, this uh, um, law over here and you'll actually get back the stochastic interacting particle system right so it is said that uh, so we can say that the interacting particle system is actually a strong approximation to the mckean plus of stochastic differential equation right um so next i would like to introduce to you the running example that we use in our work which is known as the kuramoto model and this is an example from statistical physics and it describes the behavior of a set of coupled oscillators with various applications in um, chemical engineering and biology. So the Kuramoto model is a set of one dimensional uh, uh, set of P coupled one dimensional STEs. Um, here you can see that um, the process X, the particles XP depends on a drift, co drift coefficient in which there is also some inherent randomness given by this um, term mu over here, as well as driven by the randomness due to the due to the respective Wiener paths, paths, as well as the initial conditions are also random given according to this distribution. In our examples, we choose these uh, coefficients in the drift from some uniform distribution and we and the initial distribution from some normal uh, uh, distribution and of course all these randomness are uh, mutually independent of each other and one interest one important quantity of interest in such uh, for such a model is given by the total synchronization uh, which is given as follows and hence a common quantity of interest um, for such a model is uh, the expectation of the cosine of x at some terminal time t or the sign of the same value, right? Um, right, so now we want to set uh, the objective of our uh, method. So the objective of our method is basically to build an estimator A of, uh, of an expectation as given here that satisfies a given error tolerance tall with some confidence alpha. And in our work, we are uh, particularly interested in rare event observables. So as usual, we use the indicator function given here um, to estimate rare event probabilities. Uh, we also use this Lipschitz function psi, which is defined as follows and can be visualized here um, to denote some rare event for sufficiently large K. Why we also use this function will become clear later on. So. Rare event probabilities in general, even though they are small, are crucial in a lot of contexts and hence their estimation becomes uh, very essential. Now, what are the challenges when we want to estimate such rare events associated with the McKean plus of SDE? So to estimate such an expectation, you could initially think of taking a PDE approach by numerically solving the Kolmogorov backward equation. The issue is that the Kolmogorov backward equation for the stochastic particle system would be a P times D dimensional PDE, and it would suffer from the curse of dimensionality even for moderate or small, even small uh, uh, particle systems. Another thing is that conventional numerical schemes do not handle relative errors, which are very important um, in rare event pro in computing rare event probabilities, right? Also, when working with such rare events, naive Monte Carlo is often computationally infeasible since the number of samples required to satisfy a given relative tolerance scales inversely to the probability to be computed. And this means that the rarer the event becomes, the more number of samples is required and it quickly becomes infeasible. Hence, we use important sampling to reduce high relative variance of estimators of such probabilities. In our work, uh, we use a stochastic optimal control approach to this problem, 
but there is also an issue by on issue in applying such a standard optimal control theory to the McKean class of STE. So what is the challenge? Number one, if we apply, if you want to apply stochastic optimal control to the McKean class of STE directly, you should note that the drift and diffusion coefficients depend on the probability of the sorry on the probability distribution of the process itself. So if you change the measure of the SDE um, for important sampling, then that will also change the drift and diffusion coefficients, and it will it is not a trivial matter to uh, apply the theory standard theory in this uh, in this sense. But if you want to maybe apply stochastic optimal control theory to the stochastic particle system, it would then lead to a P cross D dimensional control equation, which again would become infeasible even for very small systems, right? So this motivates um, our uh, approach, which we call the double loop Monte Carlo estimator. So the double loop uh, Monte Carlo estimator is based on the decoupling approach. And this approach was actually developed first in a work uh, by Peter Tankov and his colleagues. Um, so what we do is we actually decouple the estimation of the law from the change of the measure that we then need to apply important sampling. So how does it work? So we first solve the particle system that I've showed you before and use those particles to obtain some the empirical distribution that estimates the original making plus of distribution. We then uh, define this given decoupled making class of STE for a given realization of the empirical law. Um, and we denote this process as X bar. And note that the drift and diffusion coefficient depends, yes, on the, uh, on the state X bar itself. But if you see here, the kernel depends only on the uh, empirical distribution that we have actually uh, previously uh, computed using the particle system, right? Um, what motivates uh, this kind of a decoupling approach is that we can see easily that the decoupled McKean plus of SDE actually converges to the original McKean plus of SDE as the number of particles tends to infinity. Decoupling also, more importantly, ensures that this SDE over here is a standard SDE for a given empirical law. And what we can then you we can use standard methods like standard stochastic optimal control to define an optimal change of measure for this uh, decoupled SDE, right? So let us try to derive the optimal um, uh, change of measure for this SDE. So as I said, for a given uh, empirical distribution, let us denote by X bar zeta as the control dynamics. Whereas you can see you have this extra term in the drift, uh, which kind of pushes the dynamics towards, at least the aim of this uh, extra term in the drift is to push the dynamics towards the uh, rare event, right? And this control is um, chosen from, an ad from some admissible set of deterministic d-dimensional Markov controls. And how we choose this zeta, this control zeta, is to minimize the variance of our estimator or equivalently the second moment, right? And this gives us to the definition of our value function. So the value function is the solution to this minimization problem of, well, this is basically the um, second moment uh, given by G square of our quantity of interest times the likelihood square. And this likelihood is basically the same, is obtained from the Gibsonov theorem for measure change for standard STEs. Um, in our first work, we then proved that this value function with this structure satisfies a dynamic programming lemma. Why do we do this separately is that um, in standard optimal control theorem uh, theory, uh, the va such value function is generally in the form of some running cost plus some uh, terminal cost, all right? But here, uh, you can see that the cost structure is multiplicative in nature. That is, there is some kind of uh, running cost times some terminal cost. So which is why we have um, then proved a dynamic programming lemma for such a value function. 
And you can see this in um, our first paper here, single level important sampling. Um, I'm not going into too much detail about this in this uh, talk. And once we have proven this dynamic programming lemma, the solution to the minimization problem can then be given with the help of the nonlinear Hamilton Jacobi Bellman PDE for the decoupled making plus of SDE. And we solve for this transformed variable gamma, which is uh, very easily related to U, our value function. And you can see in this PDE that the uh, uh, that the nonlinearity comes from this term over here, right? And after solving this PDE, we get the optimal control, uh, which is a function of this uh, variable gamma, right? And the proof of this uh, theorem is also given in our first work. Um, one important thing to see is that um, this optimal control, which we have derived in the previous theorem, actually gives a zero variance estimator of course, given that our observable G does not change sign, we can actually see this by the following transformation. So this function V, which is the square of our value function U, actually turns out uh, that it solves the linear Kolmogorov backward PDE, which solves for the first moment of, uh, which solves for the first moment, right? And remember that U actually minimizes the second moment and when the second moment is equal to the square of the first moment, you know that uh, your estimator will have uh, zero variance, again, given that the observable G does not change sign, right? So actually, we can solve this PDE, this linear PDE in V, and get the optimal control for a given empirical law, and that is what we do in our work. Um, now, how, how do we relate our initial quantity of interest to this decoupled SDE? So, um, okay, um, I will introduce you to a bit of notation here, but um, let me try to explain this to you in a much more simple manner. So, let us look at this our, uh, quantity of interest, which we have this expectation over here. And in our decoupled approach, you can think of it as having two main sources of randomness, which we denote by this P and this P bar over here. So this P actually relates to the sources of randomness, which are uh, coming from the stochastic particle system. That is the Wiener processes that drive the dynamics, um, then the initial distribution, of course, and then maybe other uh, uh, ran um, sources of randomness in the drift and diffusion coefficients. Right, and given such this, and given one realization of this randomness, p bar denotes the randomness randomness only in the decoupled making plus of SDE, which is basically the Wiener path that drives this SDE. Right, so hence we can express this as a nested expectation, where first we take an expectation over all realizations of the particle system, and in the inner expectation we take. Uh, sorry, in the inner loop, we take an expectation over all realizations of the um, decoupled making plus of SDE conditioned on the empirical distribution obtained from the particle system, right? And then we apply our important sampling scheme to the inner expectation over here, um, which introduces this likelihood term here, uh, which is given in this form. And this is the same as I've shown you before. Uh, coming from the from Gersonov's theorem, right? And what we do now is then we approximate both these expectations using Monte Carlo, and this gives rise to a double loop Monte Carlo estimator, right? Okay, uh, let me then introduce you to the algorithm. Um, algorithm, yeah. So, it, so we have M one realizations of the particle system, and hence the empirical law. So this one to P denotes that we use P number of Wiener paths to simulate the um, particle system. And given this, we then solve the, uh, call, we solve the control equation to obtain uh, the, M1, the M1 realization of the uh, control. And for each realization of the particle system and the control, we have M2 realizations of the decoupled SDE, right? 
and we solve this with this we donate that we denote the randomness uh, in the decoupled mvste using this omega tilde and what we then do is take a, an average over the two loops and we obtain our um, final quantity of interest you can see that i have also note, denoted some uh, discretization parameters here p n1 and n2 so p comes from the fact that we approximate the original mckean flasov law using the empirical distribution from the particle system using p particles and we also what we also do is we use euler maruyama time discretization to um, simulate all the sdes here that is both the particle system and the decoupled sde and n1 and n2 are the number of time steps used to simulate each one respectively okay um, so now that we have this estimator and we have uh, the discretized version of our likelihood, we can now analyze the error of our estimator and we can bound it and split it into the bias error and the statistical error. Um, yes, yeah, so let us analyze the bias. So we can again bound and split the bias into two parts, one which depends on the uh, uh, approximation of the empirical of the mckean of law with the empirical law using number of particles we call this the decoupling error and also the second part is the time discretization error because of the using of a time discretization scheme so our proposal for the bias is that it is of this form over here given by equation seven i've introduced these uh discretization parameters so you can see that the one by N1 and one by N2 terms come from the um, uh, weak convergence of the weak error of the Euler scheme. And one by P uh, convergence actually comes from the weak convergence of the empirical distribution to the original mckean class of distribution with respect to the number of particles, right? Um, what we have also done here, then it verifies our proposition for the bias. So what we do in each of these plots is that we keep two of the three parameters fixed and plot the bias against the other parameter and we check the convergence rates and you can see the rates one by P, one by N1 and one by N2 here. Of course, we use the Kuramoto model. We use a very simple uh, example as I've introduced the Kuramoto model for a very smooth um, um, observable cosine, right? um then coming to the statistical error which of course from the central limit theorem you know depends on the standard deviation of the uh of our estimator and the for this we have to study the variance of our estimator and we and we can derive that the variance of our estimator um is of the following form and we get this um by using the law of total variance and conditioning on the empirical law. So basically these two terms, V1 and V2, is the variance of this conditional expectation and the expectation of this conditional variance, which you might be familiar from the law of total variance. And we condition both on the empirical distribution, right? Um, and we want to then first study the uh, convergence of these terms with respect to our uh, discretization parameters. So we can actually see that uh, V1, which is the variance of the expectation, of the conditional expectation, um, converges of the order of one by P. And this is also related to the convergence of the um, um, empirical distribution towards the original mckean of distribution, right? And the second term here uh, we see is of the order of one, which is basically a constant for our example, right? um okay so now that we have uh the bias and the variance we next want to um, see the work of our estimator again remember that we get one optimal control for each realization of the empirical law which means that we need to solve the pde m1 times and this but this would lead to a poor algorithm even for the one dimensional case right um so what we do is we actually overcome this problem by solving the control PDE using an empirical law obtained using a large number or some large number of par particles and time steps. 
We then use the same control for all realizations of the empirical law. We propose that this will give a good control close to the optimal control, but one that will give us substantial variance reduction, right? So if you see the revised algorithm, we solve for the particle system and the control equation to obtain one realization of the law. And we use this same realization for all, um, for all realizations of our decoupled SDE, right? Um, so yes, so this brings me to the um, optimal complexity theorem of our uh, double loop estimator. So considering the estimator that I've introduced, um, we can derive the optimal parameters, number of particles, number of time steps, and number of samples, such that the bias and variance constraints hold. And the optimal computational work, and which is given by here, so you can see that the work of the PDE is now done offline. And we see that the optimal work is of the order of tolerance power minus four. Okay, now some comments on this theorem. Um, we have, you might think that solving the big P, P, P uh, uh, sorry, P particle system um, might be very expensive solving it M one times. But actually, if you see, if we use only one realization of the particle system, it would lead to a one order worse complexity, right? Another thing is that we obtain the same complexity as the Monte Carlo estimator for smooth observables uh, that has been done in a previous work also in our chair by um, uh, Professor uh, Raul Tempona as well as Abdul Latif. Um, additionally, uh, what our double loop estimator does is that it reduces the associated constant drastically for rare event probabilities, right? So this is our main contribution with this theorem. And um, the proof of this theorem is also given in our first work. Um, yes. Okay. So now using our important sampling scheme for the single level, we have reduced the constant in the estimator complexity. Now we aim to reduce the order of the complexity by extending it to the multi-level setting, okay? So for this, um, I'd like to introduce the following hierarchies in the particle system given by, in the particles given by PL and the number of time steps given by N1 and N2. And here we couple them by saying that N1 and N2 are the same at all levels L, right? And tau here is the, hierarchy parameter. And for convenience, uh, we use the following notation where G donates the, sorry, denotes the um, exact quantity of interest, whereas GL is um, the discretized, um, the discretized version. And of course, we can write um, our quantity of interest using this telescoping sum, which is very common for the multi-level method. And what we do is we approximate each of these expectations of these differences at each level using the multi-level double, sorry, using the double loop Monte Carlo estimator, giving rise to the multi-level double loop Monte Carlo estimator, right? Um, now let us study the error of this estimator. Um, so basically now our aim is to derive the optimal complexity of, of our estimator. And the first step is studying the error. Again, we can bound um, and split the global error by the bias and the statistical error, right? Um, but before I go into the study of these errors, um, it is essential to see that um, for sufficient uh, reduction in the optimal complexity of the multi-level estimator, it is necessary to ensure good correlation between the samples in the fine and coarse levels for each level, right? So what we have done is we have experimented with two kinds of samplers, two kinds of correlated samplers, right? Um, which we call the naive and the antithetic sampler. So the naive sampler uh, basically uses only the first PL minus one paths in the coarse level from the PL paths, which we have in the fine level while using the same randomness uh, for the decoupled SDE in both the fine and coarse levels, okay? 
So basically we are kind of not using the whole information available or the whole randomness available, right? However, in the antithetic sampler, uh, what we do is um, it we partition. So we have we have PL paths uh, or PL uh, Wiener paths in our particle system. What we do is we partition the whole set of PL paths in the fine level and compute the quantity of interest in the coarse level using each of these tau batches of uh, the PL minus one paths. And what we then do is we take an average over all these batches, while at the same time we keep the same randomness in both levels uh, for the decoupled uh, equation, right? So this makes sure that we actually use all the information that we have available in the course, in the fine level, right? So these are the two different uh, samplers that we experiment with here. Okay. So now that I've introduced this, um, let us go, let us start analyze the bias and statistical errors. So first the bias, um, we propose the following bound, which is given by equation 16 for the bias, where this alpha tilde is the convergence of the bias with respect to the level L. And this symbol over here denotes that the left-hand side is less than or equal to a constant times this right-hand side, right? Um, we can actually deduce that the bias would be of the order of 1 by P plus 1 by N, as we have seen in the, the same for the single level estimator. This is exactly what we have also numerically verified for the Kuramoto example with the smooth observable. Right. Next, we check the variance of our estimator. And the variance of our estimator is given as the sum over all levels of the this term over here, which again, um, similar to the single level estimator, comes from the uh, law of total variance and conditioning on the law at a given level L, right? But note that here the variances are with respect to the level difference and not the single level, right? So V1L here denotes the variance of the expect conditional expectation of the level difference at level L for a given law at level L. And the same for um, the corresponding V2, right? And we propose that both these variances uh, converge uh, with the rates W tilde and S tilde respectively. Um, we try to see the convergence rates for the Kuramoto example with uh, this smooth observable first. Uh, the main idea behind this study is to see uh, the difference in variance convergence between the antithetic and naive samplers. So in the left plot over here, we have V1L, and we can see that using the antithetic sampler um, makes, uh, ensures that the variance uh, or that V1L converges one order faster than that of the naive sampler. We see a very similar thing with respect to the v with the v variance V2L as well. Uh, again, one order better variance convergence with the antithetic sampler, right? Okay, so let us try to now formulate an optimal complexity theorem for our multi-level estimator. So considering the multi-level estimator that I've introduced before and the constants tau, which is the hierarchy parameter, uh, which defines our grid, for the multi-level. Alpha tilde, W tilde, and S tilde are the rates of convergence of the bias and the two variance terms. Gamma P and gamma N are some work rates with respect to the number of particles and the number of time steps. And I will explain this a bit further in the next slide. Um, and let us assume that our bias and variance constraints hold. Um, so we can get an estimator which satisfies a given tolerance with a certain confidence level alpha. And given uh, that our constants obey such a constraint over here, we have that the work or the optimal work of our estimator is of the following order of tolerance whose complexity depends on these constants, right? So, maybe one note on why we have this constraint over here 
this constraint comes from the fact that we do not want the uh, work done by one sample by just one sample per uh, level to dominate the total work of the estimator right so hence we have this uh, um, sort of leads to such a constraint now what we can do is let us plug in some values for these constants and try to see if our uh, multi-level estimator actually reduces complexity for our problem right um, one quick note is that the um, proof of this theorem is also given in our second work which is multi-level important sampling for the mckin glass of ste right so as i said let's plug in some values okay so first without important sampling smooth observable cosine um uh, what is gamma p now gamma p is basically the work rate required to compute um the empirical measure in the drift and diffusion coefficients if you remember the uh, the kind of average that you you saw in the drift and diffusion coefficients of the particle system and we assume that we use a very naive method of computing the um this measure and hence gamma p is one so it basically means that computing the empirical measure the work done for computing the measure increases in the order of p right and gamma n is the work rate of the time discretization scheme which is also one for the euler the euler maruyama discretization with fixed time steps now if you if you remember a couple of slides back uh, w tilde and s tilde uh, we computed them or we numerically uh, verified them to be two each for the antithetic sampler and then plugging on this in it implies that our uh, optimal complexity is of the order of tolerance minus three which is one order lesser than the single level estimator but for the lower lower correlated naive sampler whose variance convergence rates were one each uh, we only get uh, an order of tall minus four complexity which is exactly the same as the single level estimator showing that there is no gain in using the naive sampler hence we use the multi-level sampler sorry multi-level estimator with the antithetic sampler for all the subsequent numerics now that we have developed a multi-level estimator for a smooth observable how can we combine it with our important sampling scheme to handle rare events our idea is to use the same single level control zeta and apply it across all levels. I think it is just a natural extension of the important sampling scheme from the um, single level estimator. The intuition behind this is that our control, since the control reduces the variance of the single level estimator, then the control could actually reduce the variance of the estimator of the level differences as well. And it turns out that it is actually enough to ensure substantial variance reduction of the estimators of these level differences, right? Um, so using this same um, the same important sampling scheme, but just apply it to each uh, of the fine and coarse levels individually, we can rewrite our multi-level estimator as follows, where then you have even though you have the same control you have the different discretizations of the likelihood which is given as follows and this is again derived from the discretization of the likelihood obtained from Gizanov's theorem right and then we can define our multi-level estimator um, as follows where g l i s basically depends uh sorry basically um uh, is defined by the g of x of t with the control dynamics and then multiplied by this likelihood term over here okay now after this we have then developed an, an adaptive algorithm which combines multi-level double loop estimator with our important sampling scheme for the mckin plus of ste so as you have seen before we do the first two lines offline so we generate the empirical law with some large P bar and n bar um, and we solve the control equation to obtain our control zeta which we then use throughout our algorithm so we basically just solve this pd once then as an input we have we need to define the number of particles and time steps in level zero of our multi-level estimator and also the level 
the relative tolerance that we need to achieve. So in our first step, we estimate and store this G bar, which is a proxy for our quantity of interest, which is basically the expectation of the single level estimator at level zero. This is actually required for error control, for relative error control. And of course, we also estimate the sample variances, V10 and V20 at level zero, using some arbitrary, some tuned um, number of samples, M1 tilde and M2 tilde. So these V10 and V20 will be used to estimate the um, optimal number of samples required for our um, estimator. So then what we do is we go through each level, starting from level one. So for each level, what we again do is we estimate the sample variances V1L and V2L using some again tuned parameters M1 tilde and M2 tilde, which are the number of samples. And using these um, sample variances, we compute the optimal number of samples M1L and M2L for each level. And we use this to update our proxy for the um, for the quantity of interest. And we basically approximate these expectations using a double loop estimator with the following number of M1L, M2L optimal number of samples, right? And then for each level, we estimate the bias, which is given, which uh, we use this estimator, uh, which you can actually easily derive by um, uh, Richardson extrapolation with uh, some number of samples, M1 hat and M2 hat which is also sufficiently tuned. And then we keep on increasing levels L until the bias constraint is satisfied. So basically the two levels of error control are the incremental, in, the incre increase in L, which kind of satisfies the bias till it satisfies the bias. And for each level, we compute the optimal number of samples which satisfy the statistical error, right? So this is our adaptive algorithm. Now that we have all the pieces, all the theory behind um, our, our numerical method, we can then um, apply it to a Kuramoto model with a rare event observable, which was our aim, right? So let us now start with the single level estimator. Uh, sorry. Uh, so first, um, let me... Uh, tell you the problem setting. So we use the, for the single level estimator, we have, we use the indicator function with some threshold K equal to two. So the indicator function basically means that the expectation is the probability that the a quantity of interest is the probability that um, X at a terminal time T is greater than the threshold K. We use K equal to two, and it is a sufficiently and denotes a sufficiently good um, rare event, which I will show you in the next slide maybe. Okay, so on the left, uh, we first try to um, prove the variance reduction in um, first the conditional expectation. So remember that we applied important sampling only on the inner expectation in our double loop estimator. So first we prove that the there is sufficient variance reduction in the inner uh, expectation alone. And this is given in the left plot where we plot the squared coefficient of variation with respect to the number of paths for the decoupled SDE. And you can see that there is almost four degrees of reduction in the squared coefficient of variation. Given that, we then try to see the um, overall reduction in variance of our double loop estimator. And we can also see a similar result here around three orders of a reduction in the uh, variance of our estimator with important sampling. One small note is that uh, to solve the PDE our control equation numerically, we uh, do it just using finite differences and linear interpolation throughout the domain because it is also a simple one-dimensional Kuramoto example, right? Okay, so now we apply our adaptive algorithm for the single level uh, to our quantity to estimate our quantity of interest, which is given by AMC. And for our threshold k equal to two, we see that our quantity, the, pro the probability is of the order of 10 power minus four, which is a sufficiently good rare event. And in the right plot over here, each marker shows the true error of our estimator 
for five different runs of our estimator for each tolerance point here. And to compute the true error or the global error, we use a reference um, double loop uh, estimator of relative tolerance 1%, right? Uh, and we see that our adaptive algorithm actually uh, uh, satisfies the global error tolerance with confidence 95% for all tolerances, right? Now let us see the work and runtime for our algorithm. Um, in the left, we have the runtime of our adaptive algorithm, and you can see for uh, sufficiently smaller tolerances, you can clearly see the uh, runtime is of the order of tolerance bar minus four. And in the right plot, what we want to do is to um, compare our double loop estimator with and without important sampling. Why we couldn't do it with um, uh, in the runtime is that um, it is literally it is very tough or it is computationally extremely expensive to uh, run the algorithm without important sampling right but we can actually estimate the work required without running the algorithm and that is what we have done in the right plot and you can see that important sampling reduces the work even though the complexity is the same it reduces the associated constant but by a drastic amount maybe of the order of i think three degrees over here so yeah um this shows how effective our important sampling scheme is um another study we have done is we have uh, uh studied the number of samples required with and without important sampling for different values of our threshold corresponding to different probabilities and what we can expect and what we also see for the estimator without important sampling is that both M1 and M2 not only increase with the increasing with the decrease in relative tolerance, but it also increases uh, as the probability decreases. So if you see for k equal to one, you only need uh, these many samples, but for uh, k equal to two, for to achieve the same relative tolerance, you need much much more samples. And this is the um, this is the disadvantage of using naive Monte Carlo. However, with important sampling you can see that the number of samples required uh, remains of the same order irrespective of the value of K. And another thing you can see is that important sampling reduces both M1 and M2, right? And this again further highlights the, um, the efficiency of our method. Next, um, for the multi-level estimator, we need to first numerically verify that our important sampling scheme actually reduces the variance of the level differences, right? So what we have taken is the problem setting here is um, the function, the Lipschitz function psi um, with the threshold k equal to 2.5. Um, yes, uh, and first we, as we have done for a single level, we show the level the variance reduction of the level difference of the conditional uh, expectation basically of the level difference with and without important sampling and again uh, we can actually see that there is very good uh, reduction in the squared coefficient of variation and if you also look at the overall double loop estimator of the level difference i think i've taken some level l equal to three here if you see it with and without important sampling again we see a good reduction in the squared coefficient of variation, right? And now what we did is we ap apply our adaptive algorithm to, our, uh, to estimate a quantity of interest. So we see that um, a quantity of interest for the threshold 2.5 is of the order of 10, min 10 power minus three, which is again a sufficiently good uh, rare event. We do a similar study for the global error of our uh, multi-level estimator, and we see that um, um, uh, that our adaptive algorithm actually satisfies um, the global uh, error tolerance with a confidence of 95%. And again, we use a reference uh, estimator of uh, relative tolerance 1%. Now let us see the uh, runtime and work estimates and actually see why, how the multi-level performs much better than a single level. 
So what we compare here is the multi-level with important sampling and the single level with important sampling. Because again, uh, running, um, running the algorithms without important sampling is computationally very expensive, right? So you can see here that um, the runtime is of the order of the single level is of the order of tolerance minus four. And it reduces it reduces the constant, right? For um, for uh, even probabilities, what our multi-level estimator then does is in addition to reducing this constant, it also reduces the, um, the order of complexity by one in our case, right? We can see this here. This is also plays out in the work estimate with and without our multi-level estimator. And hence, um, this really allows this two-level approach to decreasing the work. One is reducing the constant and then reducing the um, order, really make sure that we can feasibly estimate rare event probabilities or rare event expectations in this case, right? Okay, then with this slide, I'd like to conclude. So a few remarks before I do so. Um, so our important sampling scheme uh, was based on stochastic optimal control theory, and it reduces the relative variances of not only the single level estimator, but also the estimator of level differences, and hence the multi-level estimator. And this enables feasible estimates of rare event quantities. Remember our novel uh, single level estimator has a computational cost of order of tall minus four, um, which is exactly the same as previous works for smooth observables. But for the indicator function here, it also actually reduces the associated constant drastically. And then our multi-level estimator with our antithetic sampler actually shows one order less complexity for the treated example. And the integrated important sampling scheme along with the multi-level estimator also reduces the associated constant for um, Lipschitz observables for the multi-level estimator as compared to the smooth uh, case. And this actually enables us to feasibly estimate rare event quantities. And with this, I'd like to conclude my talk. As a final slide, I'll just keep my two works, uh, our two works here um, for reference. So one is this multi-level and the single level, both are out on archive. And um, we have also submitted, we have also already submitted this for uh, publication. and. With this, I'd like to conclude my talk and I would like to, and I'm open to any questions if time still permits, sure.